Host on the day today, flying solo, the mogul Michael Hornby is here. Flying solo, I feel privileged. This is amazing you. stuff, what it takes to get you in to co-host a show with me. All you have to do is say, can you come in Thursday? And I said yes. It really was easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In retrospect, <laughs> yeah. should do it more I think, often. Uh, Stubblefield was trying to hone in on my, my parade there. He was, he, was, he was offering his services. Stubby, is uh, he's, he's at his own private breakfast that he does with, with the big Cole. hitters at Berkeley County. There you go. Then there's the legislative breakfast this morning. Yes. Which you're skipping which, to be here. Which I skipped for you. Yeah, that's very nice of you. I brought you in a, a stale waffle uh, but, and yeah. Pop-Tarts. So I don't you, have an opponent, so they didn't really need to hear It's a nice luxury to have. Yeah. yeah. It is nice. We it's do have nice. we do have a guest on the program who does have an opponent yes. today, and, and and more than a, more than one too. Let's uh, welcome in our first guest of the day, Chris Warner, very familiar name. Uh, I interviewed this guy for the first time uh, almost uh, thirty years ago when he was uh, doing something else in Morgantown. I was cleaning out a closet because we're getting some flooring done, and I came across this shoebox full of notes from when I used to host the talk show across town. I'm reading it. I've come across one from a guy named. Chris Warner with a K. And I'm like, that's got to be the same guy. So I texted him and I said, was this you? And I sent him a little snapshot of the thank you note. He goes, hey, that was me, Rob. How you doing, man? Chris, good morning <laughs> to you. Welcome in. Good morning. It's great to be back in the Eastern Panhandle. We were both younger then. You still have your hair, though. I mine. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I'll tell you what, I just don't have my mind, though, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's guess if we can get that back today. <laughs> yeah, what brings you to the Eastern Panhandle today, Chris? Uh, we're over here. There's a, a Rotary Lunch. I'm going to join the Rotary Lunch, but uh, was just at the uh, legislative breakfast. Mm -hmm. So uh, there for a short while. When we're done, we're going to head back to the legislative breakfast. And then uh, we're having an event at the uh, Bavarian Inn this evening. 5:30. Very nice. Just a meet and greet and an opportunity to hear from residents o of the Panhandle. Open to the public? Yeah, absolutely. And what time was that? 5:30 at, at Bavarian. the Bavarian Inn. Thank Will there you. be food? Oh, there'll be food and well, drink. Well, there you go. Oh, good. Well, the Bavarian Inn, there's got to be food and, <laughs> and good beer. Good, right? Yeah. Uh, what did we have there? We had a Christmas party there one year. Uh, what was the name of that? Uh, uh, schnitzel. Schnitzel. Yeah, yeah, you had to have the schnitzel. Yeah. 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 Ask for the schnitzel. Schnitzel. All right. Yeah, it's man. pretty neat right. pulling in when there's snow on the ground and pulling into the Bavarian. Beautiful it's place. Pretty cool. Yeah. They've yeah. done an amazing job. We'll be there in a couple of weeks for a big hospice uh, event. Chris, have you been uh, campaigning all over the state? 17 counties in the last 12 days uh, and keeping a full-time job with the uh, Economic Development Authority. So evenings, uh, weekends, my wife travels with me on the weekend sean's traveling during the week so and we were talking a little bit off air about the differences between the the, the geographically as well as economically across the state can you speak to that yeah you know they're they're really if somewhere in between five and seven different segments of of the state when you look at it. i mean we all know we have our 55 counties but the economy is so different uh, in those parts of the state. And I mean, just coming from the Economic Development Authority, when we heat map it and see where uh, business is happening and maybe where we need to spend more time and attention, it is a, it's like five different states. Uh, you mentioned yeah. McDowell County. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, the, the, it just what they've been devastated. There's no other way to say it. And then you come here to the Eastern Panhandle. We were commenting, just driving down the road, just seeing the homes. Everything's new. I know you guys probably get tired of the traffic problems or whatever, but right. it's those are good problems. So, as a statewide candidate, does that make you change your message uh, when you're running for Secretary of State, or is it the same message just tailored to different people? You know, it's the same message uh, wherever we go. We're not we're not changing the the message. I mean, safe, fair, secure elections are the same in all 55 counties, all regions of the state, and uh, the needs are the same as it relates to the business registration side of the Secretary of State's office. So, if we can help an entrepreneur in McDowell County, or we can help an entrepreneur here in the Secretary of State's office, that's what I intend to do. And what would be your plan um, if you were to win? What, what is your plan for the Secretary of State's office in West Virginia? One of the things that I've, I've recognized that there's a real need, and I think that I can bring something uh, to the table on, is the business one-stop uh, with simply retraining some of those employees or additional training, not one more penny to the taxpayers of West Virginia. We can create the Office of Entrepreneurship inside the business one-stop. The business one-stop was created by Secretary of State Mack Warner, and we would be able to come in, help streamline services, be a liaison to entrepreneurs 
all over the state to help uh, get government contracts that are available. Uh, and I think we can do that again by simply retraining those employees. So uh, not adding any additional employees, but uh, we think that that's something that can be done. And the reason I say what I bring to the table and the, the letter that you talked about when, when I was here 30 or 40 years ago, um, we built business and enterprise centers with no government help whatsoever. Each one of those was about 100,000 square feet. Uh, we did the first one in Morgantown uh, in between the two campuses. Then we were asked to come to Kaiser, so we bought the old Kaiser High School and built a business and enterprise center there. Again, it's, uh, it's just like a business incubator, but you could stay as long as you wanted to. And then we were asked to uh, go to Philippi and do it at the old Broadus Hospital. In each one of those, uh, when you add up all the, the companies that located there, over 260 companies employing over a thousand West Virginians. And these are just small mom and pop operations. Some might have four or five employees. Some might just be the owner and one other person. And I, I must say, it is nice to have a Secretary of State office right here in the Eastern Pano. We don't have to go all the way down to Charleston. Is that something you plan to e expand across uh, well, the state? Well, uh, no. Uh, the, there's, I mean, limited dollars that yeah. you have to operate, but I can tell you this. The one here in Martinsburg, especially after driving five and a half hours last night, right. it needs to stay here. Uh, but the, the Secretary of State's office is doing a, a great job using AI for the you know, positive um, change. They've identified the 900 most commonly asked questions. So if you call, whether it's in the middle of the day, stop by the office here in Martinsburg, uh, or at 2 o'clock in the morning and you go online and ask a question, you're going to get the same answer whether it's a new person that's only worked for the Secretary of State's office for six months or whether it's been somebody that's been there 29 years and they'll all be saying the, given the same answer every single time. I would like to expand and have it, you should be able 24 seven to start and open your own business, uh, register with the Secretary of State, do it from home in your pajamas, you shouldn't have to come in. But if somebody needs to come in, this office in Martinsburg is, is crucial so that you're not driving three or five hours to get to a Secretary of State's office. So let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about, obviously there's choices in elections. Let's talk about what separates you from the other candidates running for Secretary of State. I would, um, we just talked a little bit about the business side. Out of the 51 employees, there are 41 employees in that office that are focused on business registration. There are only six that are focused on elections. The rest are administrative. I also bring not only the business experience, uh, and, I, and I didn't mention the, the time with uh, the USDA rural development, uh, creating jobs in the Trump administration for four years. And I'm currently at the West Virginia Economic Development Authority under Governor Justice's leadership. And uh, I don't think there's been a major economic development project in the last seven years that we haven't had a hand in or a role in in one of those two agencies. But I've also been involved on the political side, you know, locating and finding poll workers as a county chairman back in Montegalia County. Uh, then at the state level, doing the same thing, making sure all 55 county chairmen are making sure their poll workers are turned in, making sure that we're running clean elections as Republican candidates. When we challenged all 100 House seats, all 17 state Senate seats, for the first time back in 2004. And then at the federal level is the Republican National Committee man for West Virginia. So I think I have both sides of that office uh, covered and bring lots of experience to the Secretary of State's office. Chris Warner is our guest here. He swings through the Eastern Panhandle today, running for Secretary of State. And if that last name is familiar, there's a reason for that. He is the brother of Mac Warner, the current Secretary of State as a candidate uh, for governor. Chris, let's talk about your party background. We discussed yes, this with you on a phone interview uh, not too long ago. This uh, state uh, right now, if you vote in this election, this is the last one, it appears, that if you're not a Republican, you can vote in the Republican primary. Uh, going forward, that will change where you'll have to be Republican to vote in a Republican primary. Uh, take me back through the years with your involvement in the party and getting that change done and now the change back. 
You know, Rob, we were severely outnumbered. Many counties, uh, we were three to one registration, three Democrats for every one Republican. There were some counties, Fayette County, Raleigh County, we were nine and ten to one registration disadvantage in the Republican Party. So we decided to open up the, the primary. Again, we were having a hard time raising money for the party. We were having a hard time uh, recruiting candidates to run for office and then doing all that at the same time as when when we hit the magic but as state chairman I brought the idea forward that we needed to open the primary uh, up and allow it then they were referred to as independents with a small eye but now unaffiliated voters and we started growing our numbers there were people that you know, would say anecdotally you know my granddad would roll over in his grave if he knew i was registered republican and we said all right let's register independent at the time or unaffiliated and uh, that worked it over about seven or eight years the democrat party refused to allow unaffiliated to vote in their primary so we were able to open the primary bring people to the unaffiliated ranks and then as dc got crazy with the you know, the far left liberal party, folks started moving on over to the Republican Party when we had candidates for them to choose from. They, they've not always had a choice. They had a choice and we grew the party. I think there are several on the state executive committee and the reason for the vote, uh, Rob, this, this last time um, was that they, they thought we could have a primary where the unaffiliated voters control who we elect, maybe a weaker candidate uh, to go up against the Democrat in the in the general election, and that was of, of great concern. So, uh, the uh, the committee voted by a very very narrow vote. It may have come down to one or two votes um, to close the primary, but not do that until 2026. Uh, that same evening, that Saturday evening, was the last day for voter registration, or not uh, uh, voter registration, but to file to run for office. And uh, the, probably the strongest opponent filed that evening because you know, he could count on unaffiliated votes uh, to, you know, to support him in his race. So, Do you fear, having had the experience of reversing that trend in the state of uh, Democrats to register Republican ratio, as you said, I think 9 or 10 to 1 in some counties, do you fear a return and a reversal of the popularity of the Republican Party in West Virginia as a result of closing the primary? I don't think that it's going to be because of, of closing the primary, but we constantly, or I constantly, remind our candidates all across the state, do not think that this can't reverse in, in a heartbeat and uh, have uh, the Democrats back in control of the, the state. It, it can happen quickly. Yeah, especially when the unaffiliated or independent voters get to vote in a, let's say, a Democrat primary now you've gotten to, to have a say and now you you get used to voting for that person or that party um that's what my fear is that this could totally switch over the next 10 12 years it uh it very well could um again it, the the party has the ability to come back together and even make the decision before 26 that uh that they don't want to close the primary i mean the executive committee can do that and how big is that executive committee Chris? 146 members okay um, so it's those not are 12 people sitting no. in a room okay uh, yeah let's uh Chris, let's talk about safe and secure elections. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, that meant Russian interference. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, there are accusations of uh, domestic interference uh, just on our own, uh, our own land. Uh, your thoughts on the security of West Virginia's elections and what the Secretary of State can do to ensure and control that? Well, first of all, Rob, I would say that we need to follow the letter of the law as laid out by the West Virginia legislature at every turn, and as Secretary of State, I would do that. You know, so you have people say, we need to go back to paper ballots. You know, we, we have paper ballots. Uh, that is set by the legislature. How many uh, precincts in every county that need to be hand counted, that's a decision of the West Virginia legislature. So as Secretary of State, I'm going to carry out the will and pleasure of the West Virginia legislature. But in addition, I can make sure and use the position, the bully pulpit, if you will, to make sure that we never allow drop boxes in West Virginia. We never allow our voting machines to be tied to the Internet. And, an, and another one just recently for those uh, candidates out there, we're going to hold Facebook and the big tech companies feet to the fire and make sure that they file a campaign finance report when they deplatform one candidate over another or they boost one candidate's post on Facebook over another. 
again, it's not a government entity. They have the right to do that as in private enterprise, but we're going to make sure that they file an in-kind contribution and make sure that they abide by the limits in West Virginia. And I realize that's going to be a, a big legal fight. We'd like to try to recruit other uh, states to get involved in this, but it's something that needs to be done because elections are not fair if you do what Facebook and other social media firms are doing right now. Mac, having been deployed, was uh, very diligent about making sure absentee ballots from services uh, personnel overseas were uh, distributed in a timely fashion so that these votes could be counted. Uh, your thoughts on uh, this program and perhaps even expanding it uh, or making it even more efficient if possible? They allow right now active duty military to vote quite frankly, using their computer or their phone, and they go through a very detailed process once that vote comes in to make sure it's that active duty military person uh, that is voting using that electronic device. I do not think that we should expand uh, the, the use of electronic voting only for our military members that are serving overseas and can't get to the ballot place here in the States. Uh, the only other place where the electronic voting uh, should be allowed, in my estimation, is if we have uh, someone that's a firefighter and they've been called out to North Carolina at the same time that early voting is occurring and they can't get an absentee ballot, they should be able. So emergency personnel, uh, first responders that are called out of state at election time, and active duty military. In regards to relationships with clerks around the state, uh, have you built much of a base of relationships there, Chris? In each county, I always uh, make sure that we reach out because those are your real, I mean, they like to say the Secretary of State's the Chief Elections Officer, and that's the case, but it's, it's the county clerk, and I've been listening to the county clerks and hearing their frustration with a system right now that is, uh, uh, the, the, com the company name is Civics, uh, but they're constantly having to provide workarounds uh, as it relates to the electronic voter registration system, EVRS. Uh, so I think there's going to need to be work in that area if we're going to keep the county clerks on board. Uh, and they're doing a fabulous job. The Secretary of State's office is providing them the tools they need to clean up the voter rolls. And as we know, Mac and his office, they, uh, working with the county clerks, they've removed 400,000 names in the last seven years of people that have moved out of state. They've died convicted felons, but we're going to continue to have convicted felons and people moving out of state and people dying. And that needs to be a continual cleanup on those rolls to make sure that we have fair, safe, secure, and honest elections. The, regarding the Secretary of State's website, uh, tremendous information available on there and the uh, ability to track the elections on election night has been pretty good after kind of an opening night glitch to that a few years back. Uh, your thoughts on the website, any improvements that you'd like to make to well, it? No, first of all, let me uh, encourage anyone uh, listening to go to go WV, go to, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's govotewv.com. Uh, you can plug in your address and your ballot will come up and you can see who your House of Delegates candidate is, State Senate candidate is. Uh, again, govotewv.com. It's a tremendous uh you know, anywhere in the state, you plug in your address and your ballot will pop up and you can see a sample ballot. You don't have to look for one in the newspaper. You don't have to, you know, go anywhere I, else. I went and voted yesterday, and I, I must say I love the fact that it, it's digital, but it prints it on a voter card and you get to see your vote written out and then you slip it in the machine and it counts it. it it's it i think we have a great system here in west virginia it really does make you feel good about how you vote yeah i gotta pass pass something along to you on that in the seven years that mac has been the secretary of state i was talking to him the, the other evening after an event in nicholas county and he he proceeded to say that we have not had one situation where the vote count with the electronic reading of that barcode that's at the bottom of the ballot once those ballots have been turned in and then they do the audit, not once has it been off by even 1%. It's been, uh, it's been right on. So yeah. it's a system that we need to continue, but I would be ever vigilant if somebody could ever prove that something has occurred with these, I call them marking machines mm -hmm. rather than voting machines, because you do get that paper ballot. You sure do. And we do have paper ballots right now. The barcode is only there to help speed up the reading and provide confidence 
on the night of the election when people want to see their um, you know, see what the vote count is. If you're waiting four or five days before you can give a count in an election, that That's destroys ridiculous. confidence. Yeah. Chris, about a minute left. Go ahead and tell our viewers and listeners why they should vote for you for Secretary of State. I would just say that I can uh, bring you know, 35 years of uh, business experience, private enterprise business experience, uh, to the uh, Secretary of State's office and the business registration side of that office. I've also been involved in the Republican Party, a lifelong uh, Christian conservative, married for 25 years. Uh, I can bring all of that to the Secretary of State's office. I'd ask you to tell your friends and family that I'm measured and tested and I'm uh, prepared and ready to serve as Secretary of State. I'd appreciate your vote. Chris, thank you for dropping by. Thank you very much, Rob. Greatly appreciate it. Good to visit with you, sir. Chris Warner, candidate for Secretary of State.